Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast, where we explore your hidden thoughts and desires, revealing your greatest drop the soap moments. The need to have closure in any given situation is sheer human nature. And when it comes to romantic relationships, this desire skyrockets. Has your previously failed relationship left you in immense pain? It's not uncommon for people to shy away from a new relationship after their first one fails miserably. The fear of the unknown makes them hide in a shell to prevent any future heartbreak. Relatable? Despite wanting to love and be loved, you can't take the plunge if your mind and heart are still locked somewhere in the past. Maybe you aren't aware of the power of releasing the past, or perhaps you don't know how to do it. Art Costello in his online course teaches the art of moving on from bad places to happier, more stable ones. This course can change your life for good, helping you beat all kinds of negativity on the road to eternal bliss. Sign up now before the gloominess gets the better of you at expectationacademy.com. Now here's your host, Art Costello. Allison Donahue is a radio host of The Allison Donahue Show, author of the international best-selling book, The Opposite, Using the Domino Effect to Change Your Business, Change the World, Speaker and Cause and Effect Strategist, and will expand your minds in ways that you didn't think possible. And yes, I believe that. Her latest project is hashtag my part, accepting our part in every single situation we find ourselves in which brings us to a place of true empowerment with the goal to see ourselves as part of humanity as a whole rather than dividing into victims and victimizers, oppressed and oppressors, thus moving towards understanding the inherent value of everyone. My friend, Allison. Aww, I'm so happy to be here with you. I am happy. She, Allison is a doer. She gets things <laughs> done. She makes things happen. She's fun to be around. I was at the new summit in Austin with her, and uh, we spent some time afterwards. So we, we have a little bit of uh, interaction between us. But and much love. Yeah, a lot of love. <laughs> love each other to death. But she's really special in the way that she has compassion for people and really has a desire to change people and for the better. And that is really what draws you to her. She's just got the sparkle in her eye and you know that she's going to get it done. So with that being said, Allison, tell us your story, how everything happened. Oh, my goodness. Gosh, do you care what part of the story or... Did you have something in mind? I wanted to go back to as far as back as we can, because I want to dissect every bit of it. (laughs) (laughs) For real? No, just tell us your story, however you want to tell it. Okay. I would have to say I was probably a very unpopular student around my teachers because I was always questioning everything like this didn't make sense. Why did you say that last time instead of this time? And so I think that sort of set me up to move into the life that I had because I was always questioning, always wanting to see something from a different perspective. And so I um, found myself pregnant at 20 somehow. Uh, (laughs) And I was on the pill. I had no intention of ever having a child. I just never thought I'd be a great mom. And so, yeah, I found myself, I had the day after I turned 20, And then I found I was working these dead end jobs and I just, I couldn't make ends meet. I couldn't get off welfare. And for anybody who's been on welfare, there is this controlling entity that is part of your every movement. And so every decision I made was sort of like, oh, is this going to get back to welfare and are they going to cut me off? And and people who were trying to control me would threaten to report me for whatever. And so there was this constant state of fear on top of the lack of money. And it was a horrible way to live. And so I thought I'd go back to school and I went to university and I got my criminology and I was working three jobs, working a lot. I was full course load and life was kind of crazy. And then I met a guy, it's the beginning of every terrible story. And he said to me, he goes, you know, I could teach you how to paint. He was a house painter. And he said, and you'll make more money. You'll get to see your kid. And I was like, oh, I don't need to know anything else. Just sign me up. And so I ended up moving in with him. And the weekend before I moved in with him, he relapsed into drug addiction. He'd been clean for four or five years and uh, he relapsed. 
And then he assured me it was never going to happen again. And I had no choice. I had nowhere else to go. There was no safety net. I had no money. So I moved in with him. And then it was a six-year spiral into his drug addiction. Um, he was an IV drug user. And life, it was horrible. And, and I couldn't see any way out. I couldn't go to a women's shelter because I wasn't being abused. Welfare said, no, nah, your life's not that bad. Stay where you are. We're not going to help you. And I just felt like every door was getting slammed in my face. And then in 99, he died. And I thought, oh, gosh, now what can I do? I hadn't finished my degree. I was working on it, um, but I hadn't finished it. And so I thought I would start a house painting company. And I thought, oh, how hard could it be? <laughs> so I started the business and it didn't take me long to get off welfare because as most people know, you don't make much on welfare. So getting off welfare was not a huge feat. And after my first year, I went back to university and I finished my degree. I got a Bachelor of Arts with Psychology and Sociology. And then I went and taught English in Italy and ran the business from there. I had an employee here and then I came back and business just kept getting better. And I honestly never thought I would stick with it. But this is now moving into our 20th year. And then a couple of years ago, I gave a speech and somebody said, oh my God, you need to do more of this. Like your perspective is just so different. And so that's when I started Domino Thinking and I wrote the business book. And now I challenge people to think about what they think about. So, what a story. What a story. <laughs> I mean, really. I mean, you know, you could have at any point decided to just give in and not do. And yeah. About me telling people that you're a doer. That I mean, that's just proof of it right there. I mean, how many pretty young women go out and start a painting company? Not very many. I mean, I was in the contracted business for years, and really, you could count on your one hand the number of women contractors that I had here. But I was thinking about something when you were talking. We never mentioned where you're from. Can you tell yeah. people about where you live? Because it's really kind of neat. <laughs> um, I live on the west coast of Canada. I live on Vancouver Island. So we're just north of Seattle for people who don't know Canadian geography that well. And uh, yeah, it's a beautiful island. Literally an island. Yes. Yeah, wow. it is. It is, um, when is it, 460 kilometers long. So it takes about five hours to drive tip to tip. Not that you necessarily would want to, but there's some really beautiful things here. We have surfing and we have also whales, all sorts of things. Uh, eagles are constantly flying by my window. There's deer in the backyard. And it's a pretty special place. And Naimo and I have had our difference of opinions, but I think we're at a place where we are accepting each other for what we are. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever thought about any of the epiphanies that you had to get you where you're at? You know, expectations and epiphanies. Because I believe that expectations or epiphanies are a precursor to expectations in our mm. brain. We have epiphanies. Okay. Most people don't act upon them, but mm -hmm. the people that do, they turn into expectations and then they move forward from there and start moving through. Right. And making it happen. So, well, I think I always had an underlying expectation that I would do more, that I wasn't going to have a life where I was struggling, that I knew I would eventually have the life where I could do what I want. I could travel when I wanted to. I could do the things that I wanted. So I think that was always there. There was things like I was doing work for a guy who was an electrician. I said to him, I said, oh my God, you own rental homes. You own a plane. You have your business. Like, how did you do that? Like, you're an electrician. And he said, hire people. You'll never make it if you don't have staff. And so I went, oh, okay. And I started hiring staff. And so there's been an awful lot of advice that I've gotten over the years that have been light bulbs to me. I had somebody else say, if somebody has a complaint, fix them first. They move to the top of the list. Don't ever make them wait for you to fix their stuff. And that was a huge core value that I brought into my business, which made all the difference in the world. And it created a level of expectation for my clients as well, because they now expect my company to behave a certain way. And we fulfill that. That really addresses customer relationships, you know, because, and that is a great, great philosophy. Um, mm -hmm. That was wise advice from his part. Sorry. Yeah. To no, no, it's your show. You interrupt anytime you want. <laughs> yeah. So I think a lot of the things that were turning points for me is just simply because I was prepared to listen to people who knew more. Because I knew in order to have that life I expected for myself, I had to 
learn from people who had already done it. Mm -hmm. That's the catalyst for doing things. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, a lot of people look for inspiration and all kinds of things from people, but that all really is inside of you. You're the one who decides and controls what you're going to do, what you're not going to do. And of course, that's based in your expectations and in your view of them, because we mm -hmm. see our expectations either in faith or fear. Yeah. If you see it in fear, it stops everything. But if you have faith, and in your case, you know, because faith isn't always about religion. Faith mm -hmm. can be in yourself. It can be in a mentor, a parent, and coach, anybody. Yeah. So when you have that faith in yourself, which I think is where you, it really lies within you. It's mm -hmm. powerful because you're capable of anything. Yeah. And that's an excellent point. I think we have to be able to see it on some level. And, and I agree. I have huge amount of faith. I wouldn't say I'm religious at all, but the faith piece, I've always had that. I always believed that things were, were going to work out. I always believed if I worked hard and did what I was supposed to do and learned the lessons I was supposed to learn, that life would just work. And it did. And I think that mentality is um, kind of old fashioned now. Yeah, I mean, thinking back on my own story in my own life, it's the very thing that propelled me from being a little boy abandoned and everything and trying to figure out life mm. and just going and doing, you know, creating. And I always knew, I always knew everything is going to work out just the way it's supposed to be. I'm going to always be where it is, even through the, the loss of my wife to cancer in mm. 2006. You know, it took me a little while to recover from it, but in my head, I always knew that everything was happening just as it was supposed to be in accepting yeah. it and then moving on from it is what separates us all. So, yeah, it's somebody said to me one time, things happen the way they're supposed to, not necessarily the way you want them to. Yeah. That's and, and I thought, oh, gosh, that is so true. And so she said, if you turn left instead of right and you get in an accident, you were supposed to get in that accident. You might not have wanted to, but you were supposed to. There was a lesson in all of that. And I think sometimes we need distance from those lessons to really understand where the gift is. Like there's things that I talk about now that I never would have been able to talk about had I not had the experiences that I had. Were they great experiences? Not always, but it, they did give me the authority to speak about them now that I wouldn't have if I hadn't had them. And so then that is the gift in them is that I am now able to connect and communicate with other people around some really tough issues because I experienced them. It's called living. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yes. Really thriving, fun. living, thriving. Yeah. yeah. I mean, think about it. You know, a lot of people, because of fear, don't live. I mean, they, they don't let themselves be exposed to different things. They don't let them, you know, you can protect yourself so much that you really become ineffective as, mm -hmm. a, as a human. Where yeah you can expose yourself to all this and use it as a learning experience. And mm -hmm. it will just really give you a knowledge base to move on and, and just uh, do what you want to do. And Oh, for sure. And I, I was raised in a fear-based household. I was raised with that. Don't leave the country. Traveling is scary. Don't trust strangers. You know, my sister used to check her bag like 17 times on the way to school because she somehow thought her shoes were going to jump out of it and she was afraid she was going to lose them. So grew up in a really fear-based home and that was the lessons. And I understand that my mother was probably more fear-based than my father was. My father was a little bit more of a free spirit and it was her way of trying to protect us to keep us safe. Mm -hmm. It makes her very, very nervous that I have the life that I have. <laughs> Well, and that brings us to a point, you know, when protective parents protect their children to the point where it's smothering, they don't get to experience life and they get to be adults and not ever having these experiences. They have all sorts of kinds of problems, you know? Yeah. 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 And the biggest problem is a life not lived. Oh, I mean, that's. That's like that, I think, is the worst tragedy I can imagine, apart from losing a child and all of those mm -hmm. kind of things. But when we're functioning through life and we're just putting in time and, you know, those people who are just, oh, God, I can't wait for my shift to end. I'm like, you know, you're wishing your life away, right? Yeah. You're one step closer to dying every time 
you wish that minute passed, you wish that hour passed. And, and I just think that is such, it's so sad as far as I'm concerned. I always have this feeling inside of me when I get complacent about things or I'm not doing and creating or, or having fun or whatever <laughs> I'm doing. I always get the feeling that I'm missing something. Mm. And I hate to miss things. I, <laughs> what I'm, is that FOMO, fear of missing out? <laughs> it's just me. I mean, I just, yeah. no matter what it is, I want to be involved in it. I want to do it. I want to be a part of it. And I want to, yeah. I want to have fun. And I mean, it's, you know, life is too short to, to go around being afraid of everything. Oh God, it goes by so fast and you can't hit rewind. You can't get past those days that you sat around and whined or did nothing or, you know, those months that went by. And it's not to say that sometimes we don't need those downtimes. Sometimes we don't need to sit in our crap so that we can work through it. I'm a big supporter of that. But when years go by or we stay in unhealthy relationships and we're just giving away our life to something that doesn't fulfill us, that doesn't make us feel better, I think that's something we need to look at. You know, we're only allotted so many chunks of time. And, you know, and I used to say this to my staff, like, if you're going to live to be 80, you have 16 chunks of five years. (laughs) What are you doing? Like, the first five years don't count. You were a baby. The second five years probably don't count. Like, you're five to 10. You have no real say over your life. Then the next one, you're up to 15. You're a teenager. You don't really know. And up to 20, you're like, bleh. So your first four chunks of five years are gone, right? Now you're down to 12. And then you stay in a relationship that's bad for five years or 10 years, and now you're losing those ones too. So when you're looking at your life and these chunks of manageable time, how are you spending that? And how is that contributing to the end? I started really early, I guess. (laughs) Because <laughs> I have lots of chunks that I've taken up. <laughs> Good job, Art. <laughs> but you know what? The other part of the thing, I just said that to somebody the other day. I said, you know, I am so lucky. I mean, because I'm older. and uh, I, but Not know, old. Not, not old, but I'm just older. <laughs> <laughs> There's a difference. <laughs> yeah. And I said to him, you know, if I were to die tomorrow, I have done everything in my life that I ever wanted to do. Mm. And I did it without regret. Um, right. It's a little Frank Sinatra there. Yeah. And I didn't do it perfectly. Mm. And I didn't do it without controversy and hurt a few people along the way in that. But I still not regret one thing because it always taught me exactly what I was supposed to be doing and yeah. and gave me more fuel to live more and you know, because mm-hmm. I'll never give up. I mean, they're going to have to bury me for me to give up. So. <laughs> and yeah. nor should you give up, right? Like this life is precious. We should yeah. fight to keep it. And, yeah. you know, it's that, um, what did you say? It, it triggered something for me. Gosh. Oh, right. We're talking about regrets. Everything I do or don't do is always based on when I'm 80, will I regret it? Mm-hmm. Either not doing it or doing it. And it, I've done some really stupid things, thinking I'm going to regret it if I don't when I'm 80. And then I go, oh, God, I shouldn't have done that. But I never would have known I shouldn't have done it if I hadn't done it. So I measure everything. If I say yes or no to something, it's always based on, will I regret it when I'm 80? Huh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it used to be 60. But now that I'm pushing 50, <laughs> I had to bump it up because, you know, 60 seemed like a long ways away until it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> My mother lived in regret. Everything she did was regret. It was because her father was very wealthy prior to the Great Depression Mm. and then lost their fortune. And she went to private schools and was very privileged and all that. And then the Depression hit. They lost everything. I mean, they just went to nothing. Wow. That left such a mark on my mother. She could never get over it. Mm -hmm. She would always say to us, she'd say, if my father wouldn't have lost that money, well, it wasn't my grandfather that lost the money. It was, and he didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> yeah, it was the circumstances. But yeah. she could not get beyond it and get rid of it. And it had a major effect on me because I can remember as a young boy, 12, 13 years old, saying to my mom, you know, just, hey, <laughs> mom, let up on that stuff, you know? I mean, because it doesn't serve you, you know? I yeah. didn't use those words, but but she could never do it. And uh, I promised myself at that point, I would never live 
with regret. Well, maybe that was the whole experience, the way it was supposed to be, right? Had she not oh, had absolutely. been that life, had that life made those choices, you would not have made the choices that you've made. Oh, absolutely. Right. right. And, and so again, about. it's one of those things are with what they're supposed to be. Yep. Everything always works out, you know. It does. And no matter how how cruel and hard it gets, it always works out. Mm -hmm. you know? so, and yeah. often better than we imagined. Like you know, I thought I was going to do something with my life and I had an expectation about being successful, but it didn't look like this. I remember because I built and designed my house in 2012 and I remember sitting in my old house. It was completely empty. It was just me and my cat waiting for the vehicle to come back. And, and I thought, gosh, I never thought I would leave this house. Like I had been mortgage free and I thought, I'm just going to stay here and I'll just travel and do whatever. And so if somebody had told me five years prior that I would be leaving that house and building my own, I'd be like, are you crazy? It never would have happened. But then these things happen and you follow the breadcrumbs and you create this life and you make these choices that take you to places that you don't even know exist. Isn't that the beauty of it though? It's so beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's, I have a great life. It's the beauty of it. That mm -hmm. we, if we knew how our lives were going to, if it was so planned out and manufactured, it would be so friggin' boring that you, you go, God, come on, let's go party. So right. Yeah. I don't do predictable. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The same way. So yeah. Tell me about this um, hashtag my part. What's going on with that? What are you doing with that? Yeah. Well, I'm just finishing up a course that I'm going to be offering and I'm creating a card game around it. Last January, I gave a speech called my part. And I talked about the Me Too movement and how we have to be careful because everything's a double-edged sword. And then I talked about when I was sexually assaulted in high school and how it wasn't until I understood how I contributed to that rape, not saying I deserved it, not saying I was to blame, not carrying any shame or anything like that, but objectively standing back and saying, how did I contribute to this? And I did contribute to it which makes people very uncomfortable because nobody wants to hear that. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I didn't want to go out with that guy and I still went out with him and I went out with him for all the wrong reasons. And when it didn't feel right, I didn't leave. I continued to stay. And it wasn't until I understood how I contributed that I actually become free of being his victim. So then I started exploring all of that. And how does it work? Why does it matter? And I realized that all of our actions are choices, whether we admit it or not. Oh, yes, they are. <laughs> right? And we can either make our choices with awareness or without awareness. And I think when we, when we own those choices that we make, we actually boost our relationship with our worth. And I think we are born inherently worthy. And I say this all the time, this little tiny sperm found this little tiny egg and made you somehow fought through all of that crap to reach that egg, beat out all the other sperm, because if it hadn't, you'd be somebody else. So by the very nature of that, you're a miracle. And then we're born. And then the world tells us that we're nothing special. We need to be better. Our parents say, why can't you be more like? Our teachers say, why can't you be more like? Our partners say, why can't you be more like? And we believe that we're not good enough. And when we can get to that place where we own all of our choices, it actually reinforces our relationship with our worth. And when we get to that place, we are in a much healthier place and in a place of actual freedom because what's happening out there is no longer relevant. It's about all of the choices that we make. How does forgiveness fall into that and gratitude? I mean, those two things. Because mm. when I was listening to you, I was thinking... You know, Allison has forgiven herself for the things, you know, that I don't want to say regrets, but for the actions, yeah. that, the choices that you've made, you've kind of forgiven yourself mm -hmm. and given yourself permission to move on and grateful for it. I mean, because you're very grateful for it. It's, it's very so hard. grateful. Yeah. I would not have had this life if I wasn't able to understand how I contributed to it. And forgiveness is like what you say, and you totally nailed that. Forgiveness is always about ourselves. It's never about the other person. Right. And so, yeah, when I'm able to forgive myself for the choices that I make, I'm honoring myself. And when I honor myself, I'm recognizing my worth. And so forgiveness is a huge, huge part of it. And I think then the gratitude 
comes. I'm not one of these people that practices gratitude. I don't do a 90 days of gratitude and post them on Facebook every day. I don't, but I have huge gratitude. In my, and I get that that works for some people. It's just not my shtick, but it's, um, I think the gratitude is just naturally came when I was able to fully embrace and appreciate who I am. Yeah, I think people like you and I that have a very strong mindfulness about our past and our present and, and where we're going. We don't have to put up vision boards. We don't have to put up gratitude boards and, and all those. It, it just is innocent and, and flows yeah. from us and just kind of is there. It's and, that faith piece. Yeah. And I, when I see people that are so having to do that to get to the place, I think what must have happened in their life that they haven't gotten to the point where where mm. I am and stuff. But then I, I stop and I think it's because my. Has anyone ever inspired you to discover a happier, healthier, and more fulfilled you? It is a magical experience, isn't it? Inspiration is indeed very powerful, yet it's often undermined. It can lift you from the ground to the sky in no time. Have you ever thought about returning the favor by inspiring the people around you? If you don't think you have it in you, we have good news for you. Art Costello's online course has everything you need to learn to supercharge yourself and shape your character into a powerful personality. Get ready to discover your strengths and unleash the creativity within. Don't believe it? Check it out yourself by signing up for this life-changing course at expectationacademy.com. That's expectationacademy.com. My mind's always working. And, yeah, and that's always, what I love about you. <laughs> and what I was thinking is, you know, everybody's not like me. And, and mm -hmm. God forbid it, I'm thankful to God that everybody's not. Because it would be, be quite a world, I guess. <laughs> that would be fantastic. <laughs> but, you know, I guess it goes back to the individuality that, that you're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, prior. But, well, I think sometimes what happens is that we believe we have to get that worth externally. So if I am posting on Facebook 90 Days of Gratitude, on some level, I am still needing the validation from the people who read it that I'm doing well. That's what I was thinking. And we can wrap it up any way we want. And if we're doing it to inspire people, great. And if you are doing it with full awareness, fantastic. Like, carry on. If this is what works for you, it's what works for you. My fear is that people are not doing it with full awareness. And so they are still trying to get their worth externally. They're still trying to say, I am grateful for my cat so that people can then say, oh, I'm grateful for mine too and post all these great little photos. And now you feel validated. I would like to see people get to the place that whether people like that you are grateful for your cat or not is irrelevant, that you still feel validated within yourself. And that I think is that shift from announcing it, uh, making a show of it, to just being it. Good point. I mean, that's really a strong point. You know, and because I'm not tech savvy and computer and, you know, even though I've got a pretty large social media following and everything, and I post lots of fun quotes and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. I'm still old school. You know, I'm pretty old school in, my, in a lot of my thinking. Mm. So I don't watch on social media what other people do so much. You know, I don't, I don't read a lot of other people's posts. I just kind of do what I do. But that's really how I am. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I do what I do. And if people love me, they love me. If they don't, well, you know, maybe next that's how you find your people. That's how you find you, right? Is by being you. Yeah. I right. Mean, You're never going to find you by being someone else. My happiness comes from satisfying myself. It really does. It, That's good, yeah. And, but I will never do anything to hurt anyone else or anything like that. So I don't do kinds of things like that. So, yeah. you know, yeah. it's about just being me. Being, right. I'm, I'm very strong into individualism mm -hmm. you know, and thinking your own mind and taking responsibility for your own actions be them good, bad, or ugly, or whatever they want. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Just take responsibility for yourself. Mm -hmm. Because taking personal responsibility 
is another way of forgiving yourself and and living, you know, because I don't stick my finger out, never blame anyone else. It's Mm -hmm. not anyone's fault. If I have trouble with my kids, it's because of me. You know, it's something that I did. I don't yeah. blame them something that they did. I just, something that I did. Or if the car gets a flat tire, it isn't because somebody threw something out in the, in the road. It's because, golly, I just wasn't unlucky enough to run over the nail that somebody dropped out of a truck. Well, yeah. And even if somebody did throw something across the road, you were still the one driving your vehicle. You chose to go that way. And so you hitting those nails that was part of your journey. And then when you're like, okay, on some level, I've created this. You know, I talk about choices that we make. And I think there's three types of choices. One is we know and we don't care. So I'm going to text and drive and I know it's bad and I don't care. And those are probably the easiest choices to identify because when you get a ticket from the cops, you're kind of like, yeah, I know I shouldn't have doing that. It's really hard to deny that you made a choice that wasn't the best choice for you. The other way is that we couldn't possibly know. We leave the house five minutes later than normal. We end up at a red light because of it and we get rear-ended. You're still part of that experience because you decided to leave the house late. You decided to stop at that red light. Did you deserve to get rear-ended? No. Does that guy still have to pay? Sure. Because it's not about deserve or shame or blame. It just is. Mm -hmm. And then the third way is that if we took a moment to think, we may have made a different choice. And I think that's where a lot of our choices lie as well. But none of it matters because we're ultimately responsible for where we end up. Right? So everybody always wants to talk about choices. Well, I didn't choose that. I didn't choose this. Doesn't matter. On some level, you did and just own it. Yeah, one of the things that I've always thought about, you know, because I'm a Vietnam veteran and I'm, I was in the Marines, mm. and we'd be going across the a rice paddy or we'd be going through the jungle somewhere, and a guy behind me would step on the same exact ground that I had just walked on, and he'd be gone because of a landmine or he'd be maimed because of a, a landmine or a bungee pit or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I always, always thought about is, there go for me, I, but for the grace of God. How, yeah. Why did he let me walk over that same ground? And, you know, I, I've always struggled with it because, you know, a, a lot of veterans have survivor's guilt. Yeah, that's and, so and, real. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and to an extent, I do. I don't call it survivor's guilt. You know, I'm just grateful that I was there at the time that I was and that I survived it. And mm. that my faith is that God had another plan for me. You know, mm-hmm. he would take me somewhere else, you know, and it's, it's taken a long time. It's, I mean, I've, I've lived these 71 years, you know, come full circle, mm. and, uh, you know, from where I wasn't, when I started and where I'm going and ending up is just an amazing journey. Yeah. And, and it's such a blessing, you know, when, when you look at it right and everything. So mm-hmm. just thoughts. But yeah, well, and so much of it is a crapshoot, right? You don't know that if you step there and step instead of there, that could be the end or this could be a continuation. Like, we don't know. All we have to do is own those choices that we're making to the best of our ability and then not squander them. Yeah. I mean, we could pull out of the driveway tonight, you know, and turn left. Yeah. It happens, turn right and get run over by a semi. Yeah. Well, my friend's grandson just got hit by a vehicle and was killed uh, like a week ago. And you don't know. And as a parent, I'm just, I don't even, I can't even wrap my head around that experience. I cannot. Yeah. Yeah, Um, And I don't, I don't know because I believe there's a guilt and there's a silver lining in everything. And I can't even wrap my head around what that could possibly be. And it could be 50 years before anybody can do something and track it back to that moment and go, okay, that wasn't a waste. That is why it happened, right? And I'm always looking for that. This is not a waste. There is a reason for it. There's something that's going to come of this. that's going to be spectacular. That's where we're so much alike. You know, mm. no matter what happens to us, it's, you know, it was meant to be and yeah. own it and move on, get, mm. get to living. Go. Yeah. Although if anything happened to my kid, I'm not sure how much I would embrace that thinking, but I would, I would like to think I would still mm-hmm. hang on to some of it. You know, I, in my book, I talk a lot about expecting the unexpected because Vietnam taught me a lot about expecting the unexpected. Yeah. Never, 
we never went from one moment to the other new. And to jump ahead about 35 years, 36 years, when my wife had ovarian cancer, and we knew that she was uh, had it, you know, hope abounded that she was going to be fine and we were going to get through it. And uh, when year two came and we realized that nothing was working, none of the chemo was working, anything like that, we knew that she was going to succumb to it. She was going to die. And uh, the day that she died, I can remember it like it was yesterday. And I think losing a child is probably worse than losing a spouse, but losing a spouse was tough for me. 36 years we were together and uh, we had so many good times and we had so many rough times, but we got through everything. And I mean, we were always committed to each other and getting through it, anything. So that was our mantra, just get through it and, you know, we'll be fine. Mm -hmm. But um, when she passed away, it devastated me. It leveled me. I mean, and it took me about three years of acting like a jerk because after she passed, I just wasn't a nice guy. I mean, I drank, drank, drank massively and, you know, it was mm-hmm. not, not a good sight. But Well, and there, there is a process. There is a grieving. There is that space and time that's needed because I don't think we ever get over that stuff. We learn to cope with it eventually. But I don't like I don't think the pain goes away and people are like, when do you get over it? I don't I don't think you get over stuff like that. And that's OK. Yeah. Yeah. You don't get over it. The blessing for me was is that she left me with so many blessings, you know, because mm-hmm. she said a lot of really neat things about it. And I don't want to get into it with our conversation today, but she did. And then my kids came to me and said, you're dishonoring mom because you're acting like this jerk and doing all these crazy things and all that. And out of that conversation with my children, I went back out onto the lawn at the ranch and looked up into the sky and asked God what was going to become of me, just like I did when I was nine years old. Mm. And I heard that same old voice that I hear that says, you know, I get, what it said to me when after Vicky died was, is I've given you all the tools. You just need to use them. And mm. I got up and I started writing expectation therapy. And that's what came out of that whole thing. And then you think of the number of people that you have helped by paying attention, by going through the process, by doing what feels right in your heart, what feels true for you, and then honoring where that all came from, right? So your wife still gets to live in the good that you're doing and the people that you're helping. And the people that you're helping is countless. And we can never even put a number on that because it's going to manifest in ways that we don't even recognize or see or know Like you can talk to somebody and think it hasn't gone in or it hasn't been significant. And then they contact you like three months later and go, that changed my life or a year. How how did that change your life? Like, dude, really? But you know, it was such a gift that you, you listened to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. uh, Well, it was hard not to listen to it. <laughs> I mean, it was. But you were still at choice and you still could have chosen a different way. You, you're, and that, right? that is very, very true because a lot of people have those kind of moments that like I had and do nothing with them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. That, like think of all the people who said, I invented that cup thing where you rip it off and tip it back so you can drink out of it. But who actually acted on that? Yeah. Everybody was ripping their lid. But nobody designed the lid to be that way until the guy designed the lid to be, or woman, I don't even know who it was, designed the lid to be that way. And so I think the trick is to be the person that designs the lid. Step into it. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's just how amazing life is. It's Mm. just another way of how amazing life is. Yeah. I wanted to get back to something with you. Sure. You, You have a podcast. I do. A radio show or podcast? It's a radio show converts to a podcast. (laughs) <laughs> what do you do on that show? I want to hear because I know some of it, but I want you to um, tell me more about your show. I challenge people to think about what they think about. <laughs> so it's quite philosophically based. It's uh, I want to bring on guests where my listeners can say, oh, I never thought of it that way. I want to create this safe space to hear a different perspective so that we can see if it's tried on and see if it fits for us. And not everything that my guests say is going to impact people or change their lives necessarily. 
but I don't think we examine our beliefs enough. And I always end up every show with, um, if you don't question what you believe, what's the point of believing in it? And I really want to encourage people and hold people capable of getting to that place where they can start questioning their belief. And it's wow. changed my life having my show, like in ways I never would have anticipated. That's really interesting <laughs> to me <laughs> because, you know, I love challenging people's beliefs, but I don't know if I'm into as challenging people's beliefs as into expounding my own, mm. my own beliefs. Yeah. You know? and then, well, I, that's, I think, a double-edged sword, right? By doing it for yourself, people, you're modeling it for other people and they can't help but then do a little bit of what you do. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that's what I want to do. I want everybody to understand the power of expectation because yeah. it is really, really a powerful tool to mm -hmm. have in your, in your tool chest. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I totally agree with it. It's uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a fun journey. I, I, I've been focusing a lot on men's rights and feminism for the last eight, nine months. So after I gave that speech, a guy reached out to me and he told me about when he was raped by his wife and put in the hospital. And some point during that conversation, and I've listened to my show and I, I cannot pinpoint when it happened, which I think is indicative of a lot of things that happen in our life. But at some point, I realized that I was looking at men through the lens of a woman. And it wasn't favorable to men <laughs> that I had bought into the second, third wave, parts of the second, third wave feminism, which treats men like lesser citizens and not as complete beings. And so I thought, oh, I should probably explore this further. So I spent eight months of having people come on my show talking about men's rights and feminism. I you know, read Warren Farrell. I read Rolo Tomasi. I've read uh, or watched the Red Pill documentary. And just uh, Cassie J is, is incredible. She has a really great TED talk too about we need to stop expecting to be offended. So I spent eight months just really focusing in on that. And I think because I gave myself permission to step back from being a female and trying to understand men, that I am a better female as a result of it. And it's been a really interesting journey. But I've had on people who talk about pit bulls and breaking down some of the myths around them. Um, like humanizing the dog and, and instead of demonizing. I had on a professional BDSM sex master, which was really interesting. I've had people talking about prison reform. I had a transgender woman come on talking about some of the questions that she's been asked. And so just really, I'm really lucky. I, I meet the most interesting people. <laughs> yeah. And you know why that is, don't you? Well, because I have a radio show. <laughs> no, because you're so interesting. <laughs> because you. You, you know, you can't be around you and not want to get to know you. That was, that was my my feeling anyway, that just being around you is like, hey, I got to meet her. I got to know her because you're so full of energy and vim Aww. and vigor and all that stuff. So, you know. I love that you felt that way. Otherwise, you know, we may never have connected the way that we did. And yeah. I think you're just such an important person in my life. I'm so grateful that uh, the New Media Summit happened so that I got to meet you. Yep. Another thing that happened in our lives that just made it all possible. That's right. How have you navigated understanding the world better through all of these experiences? Oh, gosh. You know, some days I think I understand things and other thing, days I think I don't understand anything, <laughs> which I think is a normal growth process, right? I think we, it expands and contracts, right? We're like, oh, okay, I got it. No, no, I don't got it. Yeah, no, I got it. And, and each time we, um, you know, go through this process, we become closer and closer to some sort of self-actualization. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think it's the curiosity piece, too. It's I want to understand my world and therefore I will understand it throughout this expansion contraction. I'm still going, I'm every day I'm getting closer and closer to understanding things better. And, and part of understanding things better is knowing that I'm never going to understand everything. But the importance of being curious enough to want to, to challenge, to question, I think that's the, the shortest route to um, learning. Very true. Very true. What recommendations for books have you oh, want to give us? Gosh, I think anybody who wants to talk about men and women needs to read Warren Farrell, either The Boy Crisis or Myth of Male Power. I think both of those are extremely powerful books in understanding how the double-edged sword of feminism. 
super important. I just finished reading David and Goliath. Was it Malcolm Gladwell, I think, wrote that? And I thought that was super interesting in so far as, well, he's just brilliant, but how often we will see our disadvantage as a disadvantage instead of seeing our disadvantage as an advantage. So me being on welfare, I had nothing to lose. So I may as well start my own company, right? You know, not knowing anything about business could have been a disadvantage, but it was also an advantage because it didn't scare me into not starting something. So often when we have this disability or disadvantage is actually has given us a different way of coping with things. So that book, I think, has been really interesting. And, you know, there's a woman who wrote the art, uh, something about being wrong. She's a wrongologist. And it was fascinating. So yeah, there's lots of books. So right now, those are kind of, and of course, anything Simon Sinek, I I love him. (laughs) One day I will meet him. (laughs) It's, uh, It's my expectation anyway. I've got one I want you to read. Yeah. It's a quick read. It's not hard. It's on Oprah's uh, reading list, and it's called The Sun Will Rise, and it's by Anthony Ray Henson. Okay. And it's a book about faith. Mm. And let me just kind of give you a little bit about this. He's spent 30 years on death row in Mississippi. Is it a true story? True story. Oh, okay. Ab- absolutely true story spent 30 years on death row for murder. He was committed for murder. Mm. And at year 10, he has never, ever said he was guilty. He says he's innocent and he didn't do it and that it would be proven at some point. At year 10, they told him, you can get out of here if you all admit to it and sign a paper and we'll let you out. He said no. He spent another 20 years in prison, but his story of faith is so great that it's just a it's a wonderful uh-huh. read it's it's not a big long thick book it's it's pretty quick but it, it's well worth the read yeah that you will find very few people who are as committed to living their life i mean he was a young man when he went out into prison yeah 30 years later come out and think of all the things that he missed like computers and cell phones and yeah. I mean, just things that we normally have and how everything's progressed. Mm-hmm. But uh, he was let out every, every single day. He had one hour out of a cell because he was on death row and he had one hour to see the sun. That was it for 30 years. So, but anyway, well, I will definitely get it. I'm always listening to books in my vehicle. Go audible. Um, (laughs) uh, because I spent a lot of time driving. And so, um, I will, I will add that to my list. Yeah. That's a good one to get You'll enjoy it. Well, we're nearing our time to end. Oh, yeah. Kind of how I feel too, but we'll do this again. I would love it. (laughs) What piece of advice can you give our listeners that you really want to end this with that really will have an impact on their lives. I I really want to remind people that they're worthy. No matter what is going on in your life, no matter what you've done, no matter the choices you've made, no matter the situation that you're in, you are worthy. And if you can start to understand that in little small pieces, it will change your life. It will move you to a place of freedom and it will move you out of any area that you're feeling like a victim in and it allow you to step into the life that you really want because I promise you, you are worthy. Where can people get a hold of you? Website's the easiest, dominothinking.com. There's a contact page on there. I answer all of my emails. If anybody wants to ask questions or connect or whatever, I have a newsletter that goes out. People can subscribe to that if they want to. It's a uh, low key, no pressure, no selling. So it's just thought provoking things, you know, connections to my radio show. And after every guest, I have a challenge. So that usually goes in a newsletter and gets uh, challenges people to do something. Hmm. I'm trying to think of what we can challenge you to. to get ah. stuff in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would challenge your listeners to do a list of areas that they think they're spectacular with. And I don't care if it's you like your hair or you're kind to cats. Just make a list of all of these things that makes you pretty amazing. And then just every day, just keep adding to it until you start to believe in your own worth. On that note, (laughs) (laughs) 
Thank you, my friend. I, oh, I, I love you. You're always a delight to talk to. Uh, I want to spend more time with you so we can uh, we can do this and help more people. That's yeah, what, that's what it is about for you and I. About it is. Others. And I think there's some magic that we're going to do in the future. So I cannot wait to see that unravel. That is my expectation. I see us doing something really cool together. So much love to you. Yep, I agree. I think there is something special coming up. I already have it in my head, but we'll see. Ooh, (laughs) can't wait to hear. (laughs) I'm game. So whatever it is, yes. Well, listeners, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it. And I know Allison appreciates you being on there. Have a great day. Enjoy it and live it. And just like I like to tell people. Don't know which direction you want your life to take. Are you sinking deep down into the pit of uncertainties day by day? So what's the secret to leading a happy, satisfied life? It's taking matters into your own hands. But what if the matters in question are a total blur? Art Costello's Expectation Academy course aims to tell you exactly how you can get some clarity in your life. This course can be your savior on your journey to reinventing yourself. While you certainly can't plan your whole future ahead, you can definitely control twists and turns your life takes. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for this course now at expectationacademy.com. Get a chance to broaden your horizons and add meaning to your life. That's expectationacademy.com. Just become a doer and then make doo-doo all over the earth. (laughs) (laughs) Goodbye, people. Thanks for listening to the show. Drop us your comments and questions with what you want answered on the show. You can subscribe on iTunes and Binge Network. You can also get more information on the website, expectationtherapy.com.